Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Church Without Walls. Uh, I want to take a wee bit of time this morning. Um, Phelan has asked me to share some thoughts that I have had just on the my awareness of um, God's gentle spirit with me and how he's been working in my life over this time of lockdown. Um, I want to begin just by defining for you uh, what a gentle spirit is and what a gentle spirit looks like. So I've gone to Mr. Google and I'll just read you a, a definition from there. A gentle spirit is a spirit that can pause, meditate, reflect, and revel in the glory of God. It is someone who can't do it by themselves, but will and do it through the precious blood of Jesus. Now, what that is saying to me is that a gentle spirit is someone who takes time. They take time out of, as Jesus did, took time out of his ministry, took time aside quietly on his own. And he also recognised that he wasn't on his own. He didn't do anything of himself. He, he quite clearly said that everything that he did, he did because he saw what his father did. So it was a completely dependent uh, relationship. But I want to share just two points, really, um, of what God has been quite clearly saying to me just uh, at the moment. And the first point is this. By being in his presence, God's presence, things can change. Now, we change, our environment changes, and our perspective on our problems change. Now, how can that be? How could it be that simply being in the presence of God, that that can change anything? That, that's, that's very difficult to comprehend. Um, but I want to give you an illustration from my own life of how this happened. Um, just before lockdown, my father moved into my house with me. Now, I had things that I needed done at home. Like, for example, I have a garden at the front of the house. And it was like a jungle, a complete and utter mess. Now, I knew it needed done, but I never found the time to do it. So dad moves in and he has it from the beginning that that's his priority, that he wants that garden sorted out. So he sets about, not by himself, he does include me in the project, but he sets about to have that garden changed. Within a space of a couple of months, I have now got the most beautiful garden that people in the street are stopping to see. Now, before that, people were stopping to see it because it was a jungle and they were commenting on and asking, does anybody live in that house? But now they're stopping and they're saying, wow beautiful, the walls are painted, the plants are growing, it's absolutely beautiful. Why am I telling you that? Because it was my dad being with me in the house that made that happen. I couldn't have done it by myself. As much as I wanted to do it, as much as I wanted the benefits of it, he needed to be there to, to get the people in, to provide he actually provided a lot of the financial support that I needed to get it done. Um, I couldn't have done it by myself. But the beautiful thing is not just have I got a beautiful garden. I'm enjoying the benefits of it. Do you see at times I can go out to my garden when it's not raining with a cup of coffee and I enjoy all the benefits of it. But not only that there's neighbours in my street that have come and sat in that garden and enjoyed the benefits of it as well. Now that was God showing me, do you know what Michelle? You be with me, you abide in me, I will change your environment, I will change how you think and it's as simple as that, just abide in me. Now he also then 
wanted to show me what what kind of relationship did I need to have with them. Um, and quite clearly, again, I want you to I want you just to read this. This is what he said. I want you to know me for who I am and not just for what I do for you. I want you to have a mature relationship with me. And again, you know, the father spoke, but I needed an illustration. I needed to understand that from my perspective. How could, how, how could I comprehend what that meant? And this is what he said. I want you to think about your relationship with your natural father and how that has changed. So I thought about when I was a child, my relationship with dad was what I would describe as a monologue, not a dialogue. It was a monologue. It was a list of dad I want, dad I want, could you get, could you get. That was, that was normal. That's what you would expect of a child. But as I grew up, and I have a relationship with my father as an adult. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. It's a sharing of ideas. It's an engaging things together. It's a more mature relationship. That's the relationship God wants with me. He wants to come along and be part of my life. Um, but he wants me to listen to what he has to say as well. And you know what I have learned over this whole lockdown? listening is something that is so so important for we, we like to talk we like to um well, even in our prayer life but i have actually learned to sit and just listen and do you know what i hear god's heart when i do that i hear god speaking to me and, and it really is changing uh things within me and the reason why that is is because god's actually more interested in um, the internal heart than he is in the external thing. And I'll, I'll just read you a scripture that illustrates this. And 1 Peter 3, verse 3 to 4, what, what, is, what Peter is actually talking to ladies who are very well uh, dressed up and uh, he wants to explain to them how, you know, that uh, to be a, a wife to their, a good wife to their husband, that they need to be interested in their own equalities as well. So I'm taking a wee bit at an out of historical context, but it says exactly what I'm trying to say. And this is what, how it reads. Your adornment must not be merely external. With interweaving and elaborate knotting of your hair and being superficially preoccupied with dressing in, in expensive clothes. So it's not just the external how you appear to the world that God's interested in. But let it be the inner beauty, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit. One that is calm and self-controlled, not over anxious, but serene and spiritually mature. Which is the very, which is very precious in the sight of God. Our God is so interested in our heart, not just merely on the outward appearance. He is interested in us um, being like Him, and He is, He is someone who, um, from my experience, comes alongside and uh, works through us in a way that is very effective um, and very natural. And I really do believe that God wants us to continue in this way, to keep working, not even working, keep walking in his spirit. Um, and that's how the word is, will be changed. And that's how we're being changed. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon.
yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Well, good morning on a rather damp and cool July morning. If you remember last week, we looked at the great authority in which Jesus lived and spoke, and we saw that this confidence and authority came from how he had grown, in the revelation of how his life and the Father's life were one. Now, this growth was so powerful that even by the age of 12, Jesus was describing his own actions as my Father's business. Later, he was even able to say, to see me and to hear me, 
is to see and hear the Father. And I shared how I believe that this is the high calling of God for His church, the body of Christ, to live in the power of communion with God's Spirit to such a degree that people only have to look at the way the church is living to see before them the life of our good Heavenly Father. It is a life of authority, confidence, rest and joy in all seasons, especially brightest and most striking in the darkest seasons of life. I believe Jesus never spoke with more authority or sounded more like a king than when standing beaten and bloodied before Pontius Pilate. Pilate had stood in the presence of Caesar. He was a man who recognized authority, yet what he saw that day shook him. Jesus' disciples had witnessed his supernatural confidence as he slept through a storm that terrified them, and then they saw the authority with which he calmed that storm with one word. Pilate also witnessed Jesus completely at peace in the midst of a storm, a storm of hit and murder that was breaking over his life. He too then witnessed authority as he had never seen it before, only this time not in Jesus calming the storm, but in his refusal of Pilate's invitation to say something to calm that storm. The authority in Jesus' life left Pilate powerless. He saw his every threat to take away Jesus' life have absolutely no effect because you can't take away the life of someone who has already given away their life. Jesus never lived as if he had a life of his own, but always lived the shared life of Father, Son, and Spirit. This is the authority Jesus gives to his church that comes by the revelation of the Holy Spirit to see our lives as already in the Father. When the Spirit opens our eyes, raises our vision to know the heavenly reality of our lives being hidden with Christ and God, then this world loses its power over us, either to threaten us or to tempt us, for nothing this world can offer us can match what the Father has freely given us in Christ, all things. This is the journey the Holy Spirit would lead us on, a growing up into Christ's life, the life that has overcome the world. I want to return to this truth today, for God's purposes and plans are worked out in our lives, not by what we do for Him, but by our living with Him and in Him. Indeed, all the promises and blessings of God are realized and fulfilled in our lives in Christ. Now, last week we spoke about how Jesus grew in the revelation of his identity in the Father, his shared life with the Father. And this week I want to speak of how the Holy Spirit grows us up in Christ, the shared life of the Son. The Apostle Paul actually described this growth to the Ephesians as a growing up into the head, Christ. I believe the high calling of God for the body of Christ, the church, is that we grow up together into the life of Christ by growing so conscious of our union with the Father in the Son by the Spirit that increasingly what we do is what He is doing and what we say is what He is saying. To grow up into Christ is to increasingly be doing less and less for God and more and more with Him and in Him for our lives are hidden with Christ in God. The primary challenge before the church right now, in this season when the pause button on church life has been pressed, is to stop long enough to recognize that so much of what we've been doing for Him has not come from being with Him. No matter how long doing church has been stopped, it won't have been stopped long enough if we simply go back to doing church rather than living in and from our heavenly communion with the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. I believe the Lord would still say to His church now something He first said right at the beginning of the church age. Don't set out without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now back then He was speaking to His disciples about the Holy Spirit coming from on high because the Spirit had not yet been poured out on the day of Pentecost. So the older translations of His actual statement are, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now, that outpouring of God's Spirit from on high has already come. The Holy Spirit was poured out from on high on the day of Pentecost. But in speaking of the flowing of His Spirit in and from His church, Jesus spoke of rivers of living water, not flowing from on high, but flowing from your innermost being. The older translations have Him saying, out of your belly, 
will flow rivers of living water. If you are a believer today, a Christian, you do not have to wait for the Holy Spirit to be given to you. For you cannot even be a Christian without already having the Holy Spirit in your life. For his word declares that all who are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. The gospel also boldly declares to all believers that the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead now lives in you. In fact, the only reason you opened your heart to receive Christ in the first place was because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. For as Paul declared to the Corinthians, no one can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Spirit. It was to those same believers that Paul also declared, don't you know, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, to listen to some believers, you would think that the Holy Spirit went back to heaven and we have to implore him to return. Yet the truth is that he was, in fact, already at work on our lives years before we ever give him permission to be so. And the Holy Spirit is also today at work on countless lives across the world who do not yet know Christ. For he is still the spirit of the one who said, I have come to seek and save the lost. So, if all believers, all Christians, already have the Holy Spirit, how can I say that the Lord wants us to wait for His Spirit before setting out? I can say that because Christians like us have been setting out for generations with the Spirit, but not in the Spirit. Let me say that another way. Yes, we carry the Holy Spirit, but God's great call in our lives was not just that we carry His Spirit, but that His Spirit carries us. That's the description the Apostle Peter gave in his second letter of the effect of God's Spirit on his people down through the generations. 2 Peter 1.21 records that description in these words, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So yes, as believers, we always carry His Spirit along with us, and we do a lot of speaking, often not with very much supernatural results. But to be carried along by His Spirit is to speak from a different realm, a higher realm, because the Spirit carries our thoughts to a higher realm, a higher life, the life of communion with God's Spirit. You see, to speak in the Spirit is to speak from a place of communion with God. It is to speak not in the language of separation, but in the language of union, the language Christ spoken. How can it be God's will that the body of Christ speak in a language that Christ himself never spoken, the language of separation? I'll say that again. How can it be God's will that the body of Christ speak in a language that Christ himself never spoken, the language of separation? Believer, we are to speak from a higher life, but to speak from there, we have to let the Spirit lift our thoughts to think from there. And this is why the Spirit spoke through Paul to the Colossians and speaks today to us these same words recorded in Colossians 3. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. Now, when God speaks, light comes where there is darkness, and order comes where there is chaos. It was always his will that his church, his body on earth, would bring his kingdom, his light, his order onto the earth by speaking his words in the power of His Spirit. Let me put that another way. It was always His will that His people, carried along by His Spirit, could live in and speak in the Spirit, so that we, the body of Christ, could each grow up to say what the head himself said. I do not speak on my own. I only speak what the Father gives me to say. Such heavenly words, words spoken of the Spirit of God, bring the kingdom of God into the earthly realm, and this is his kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. To be carried along by the Holy Spirit for the believer is to let his Spirit carry our thinking up, up into the heavenly realm, that we may think from there in order to speak from there. Why? Because words from the Spirit bring life. 
As Jesus told Nicodemus, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Earthly wisdom can only produce earthly words and bring natural results. Only supernatural, above natural words bring above natural, supernatural results. No wonder the Apostle Paul said to the Colossians, set your minds, your thinking into the above natural realm. And to the Ephesians he declared, be thee being filled with the Spirit of God, speaking to each other with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Now Paul wrote that because he knew such words from the Spirit always impart life by lifting the thinking of the church up into the mind of Christ. It was such words, words from the Spirit, from the eternal realm, spoken by the disciple Ananias to Paul himself in Damascus, that first opened Paul's eyes to the realm of God's Spirit, a realm where, as we've seen in previous weeks, God can call you by a name you've never heard before. As Paul heard such words, Acts tell us that something like scales fell from his eyes. Only words from the eternal realm of the Spirit of God, the heavenly realm, words that speak to us according to our eternal calling in Christ, only those words still have the power today to cause something like scales to fall from the eyes of men and women who've never been able to see beyond the earthly appearance of their lives. So to say, don't set out without the power of the Holy Spirit is simply to say, don't set out to serve God without His vision. Don't set out to serve God blind to the enormity of what Christ has completed and finished by His death and resurrection. Because if you can't see, Christian, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself and is now no longer counting their sins against Him, then all you will do is lead people into self-effort, religion, lead them into trying to do something about their sins. Paul declared that in light of Christ's work of reconciliation, he now regarded no man after the flesh, but after the Spirit. To set out to minister the gospel with no revelation of the comprehensive and finished nature of Christ's dealing with all the sins of the world leaves you blind to how God now sees people. You will only see them after the flesh, not after the Spirit. You'll only see them as men see them, not as God sees them. For a start, God doesn't see their sins as their problem. He sees their sins as the evidence of their problem, the branches off a root, and that root of all their sins is unbelief. That is why Jesus, in speaking of what the Holy Spirit would say now to the world about sin, declared in John 16, 9, that the Spirit would speak to them concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Let me use an illustration. Imagine you come home one day, one dry, sunny day, to find that there's water pouring through your kitchen ceiling from the bathroom above because someone went to fill a bath earlier that day and forgot to turn the tap off. I think you would agree with me that you have a problem. Having gallons of water in your kitchen is a problem. Now I'm going to give you two options for dealing with your problem. Which option you take will depend on what you see the problem to be. Here's option one. The problem is the amount of water in your kitchen. You need to start dealing with the water in your kitchen and keep dealing with the water in your kitchen to get the level of that water down to as low as you can get it. Here's option two. The problem is the running tap. You need to immediately go upstairs and turn off the tap in the bath because if you don't deal with the source of all this water, then you could spend a lifetime mopping up water in your kitchen. Now I'm sure you realize that you should really take option two and go upstairs to deal first with the root of the problem. But what you may not realize is that when it comes to sin, multitudes of Christians feel themselves to be in a lifelong struggle to keep their head above water down in the kitchen. That's because many of us have spent years now attempting to mop up the sins in our life, or at least to get them down to a level acceptable to church-going people. We have been the blind leading the blind, never seeing our real problem because we've never gone upstairs. We've never had our vision lifted high enough, our eyes open to see what heaven can see, that all our sins are not the problem. They are only what is flowing from the problem, the blindness of our unbelief. Sins are a grasping for life, a grasping in the dark. It is all men can do when they remain blind to the truth that in Christ and Him crucified, they have been given everything they need pertaining to life and godliness. 
Now listen to what Paul said to the Corinthian church, a kitchen that was, you have to admit, pretty full of water. He didn't give them advice on how to bail out water, how to sin less. Instead, he spoke words from the heavenly realm about them. He did that knowing that unspiritual, carnal believers would find such words very difficult to accept. But nevertheless, he spoke such words to them because he was convinced that only their eyes opening to see themselves as the Father saw them in Christ and see how well provided for they were and the high calling and value that God had in their lives, only seeing that would turn them away from grasping for the things of this world. So again and again, he spoke heavenly words to them of who they were because of what Christ had done. He declared to them words to lift their vision out of the earthly realm and into the heavenly. Don't you know that you're not just mere men, he declared, that you don't have to live as mere men? Don't you know that your bodies are the very temple of the Holy Spirit, that you are the meeting place of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men? Don't you know that you all have it all, that all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God? Don't you know that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has imagined what God has prepared for you, but you can know these things by the Spirit, for you have the Spirit who searches all things, even the depths of God. Indeed, you have the very mind of Christ. Can you see what Paul is doing with such words? He's not mopping out the kitchen. He's going for the running tap. He is going for the lies that are flowing into their minds from the world around them and filling them so full of fear that they've started to try and grasp for life to save themselves. He is preaching to them the gospel of Christ's finished work, the gospel that declares that in Christ they have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because it is only that gospel that delivers men from darkness and all their grasping in the dark by bringing them into the light of the kingdom of God where there is enough righteousness, peace, and joy to satisfy their souls forever. Paul is speaking words of the Holy Spirit. He is speaking to them in the Spirit. He is prophesying over them, not so much foretelling their lives as forthtelling their lives, speaking of their lives as their Father sees and calls them to be in Christ. He is speaking to them as a man being carried along by the Spirit. He's not speaking to them as a blind man, but as one who has had his own eyes opened to see people from a heavenly perspective, from the perspective of Christ, the perspective of him who has sat down in the heavenly realms. Christ has sat down because he knows that his one sacrifice for sins forever was sufficient to reconcile the whole world to himself. And there is now no more sacrifice for sins. Rather, whosoever will believe in Christ's work, not theirs, can now enter into, live in and live from the peace of God, the set at one with God life, the life of Christ. This is why we preach the gospel of Christ's finished work, because to do so is to deal with the running tap, the unbelief that is feeding the works of the flesh, the self-effort life, which is not a faith, and therefore by definition is sin. For the New Testament has this to say about sin, Whatever is not from faith is sin. Christian, if you insist on continuing to see yourself only after the flesh, not someone who has been married to Christ, whose spirit is one with God's spirit, but rather someone from whom God has socially distanced himself because of the sins in your life, that earthly perspective on your life will never lead to less sins in your life because the root of that religious life of self-effort is unbelief in Christ's work. And as long as that tap is still running, you'll always be up to your neck in sins. Now granted, they may be different sins. You may have managed to give up your addiction to certain substances, but what you don't see is that you've simply swapped one set of addictions for another. For now, you're addicted to measuring people and judging them. You don't see that as sin, but it is, because according to Romans 14, 23, anything that is not from faith is sin. And to treat people as if God is still counting their sins against them cannot be of faith, for such blindness is always the result of unbelief in the sufficiency of Christ's one sacrifice for sins forever. I've been speaking this morning about God's desire for men and women to be carried along by the Holy Spirit up into the higher perspective, His heavenly perspective, 
his eternal perspective of their lives. For all of heaven sees us in light of Christ's finished work. Only by that light can men see, and the preaching of the gospel of Christ's finished work is the shining of that light into the darkness of men's unbelief. Now let me finish this morning by sharing with you two pictures of how God's Spirit carries us along up into this higher life, this above natural, supernatural vision from the heavenly realm, the eternal realm, where everyone sees this world in the light of Christ's finished work. The first picture is that of an eagle. You know the scripture well, Isaiah 40, 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now notice the higher place was reached by waiting on the Lord. Now a couple of years ago, a good friend was sharing that word in River City and she pointed out to us that that, that word translated as wait was actually a Hebrew word whose root meaning was to bind together by twisting. This is what the word tarry or wait pictures. Two lives being intertwined or weaved together. In other words, those whose lives are weaved together with the Lord's shall rise into a higher perspective, a higher place. This is what it means for the Spirit-filled New Covenant Church to wait or tarry on the Lord. It is to grow up in the revelation of how her life is weaved together, bound up in the life of Christ. I believe the more the church grows in this revelation of her union with Christ, the more she is carried by the Spirit into the heavenlies to live and speak from that higher life, a life not of becoming, but of being with God. The more the church grows in this revelation of her union with Christ, the more she is carried by the Spirit into the heavenlies to live and speak from the higher life, a life not of becoming, but of being with God. Words spoken from that place, the height the Spirit carries us to impart life in a way that the best advice from all the experience in the world honed in the natural realm never can. So yes, we carry the Holy Spirit, but God's great call in our lives was not just that we carry His Spirit, but that His Spirit carries us. Here's the second picture of what that means for New Covenant believers to be carried along by the Spirit within them. Think of a river flowing along, but only at a trickle. There's not enough depth of water to lift a boat to carry it along. But if that river suddenly rises in power to flood level, even the heaviest of boats are lifted and carried along by the power of that river. Yes, there was a day when the Spirit rained down, a day in history when through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers did pour incessant from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice did kiss a guilty world in love. God has indeed poured out His Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But according to Jesus' picture of rivers of living water, there is now a river of His Holy Spirit which resides in the spirits of believers, their innermost being. But in so many of our lives, it has remained an underground river that only very occasionally breaks the surface. You know, if you look across the world, many denominations or church groups are very like carved out dry riverbeds. They are a reminder of previous times when the Spirit flooded a nation, but now those riverbeds are either dry or only contain a little stream. Genesis 7 tells us that the flood that lifted Noah's ark and covered the earth did not just come from the rain, but that God opened up the fountains of the deep. Waters rose up from deep underground. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well that the living water he would give her would become a fountain in her, welling up to eternal life. I love this picture of God's Spirit as living water, flowing in the innermost being of every believer, in our spirits, but then rising up to flow out from our spirits into the earth. As that river flows, it even quickens both banks of the river, our own souls and bodies, bringing life and fruit to both. But what calls up, what calls forth these rivers of living water that bring life-giving words to people dying of thirst? I believe words spoken from the Spirit of God 
through believers living in the Spirit, living from their heavenly position and identity in Christ. David wrote, Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. What are these words that lift our thinking out of the natural earthly realm and up into the eternal realm, the realm of the Spirit? They are words from outside of a temporal earthly perspective on our lives. They are nothing less than words spoken from the mind of Christ, a mind that sees the end from the beginning and so knows that all that needs to be done for you and I has been done. We could call them words from the heavenly realm, a realm in which Christ has sat down and us with him, because everyone looking at the earth from a heavenly eternal perspective is at rest, because they can see that Christ and him crucified was enough to reconcile man to God. The more a person believes this and grows in this metanoia, this change of thinking, this true repentance, then the more they can live as someone set at one with God. And as we've seen in previous weeks, the Greek word for set at one is irene, which is translated throughout the New Testament as the word peace. Let me say all that in a different way. If you will believe what the gospel actually proclaims, that Christ and him crucified was enough to reconcile you to God, enough for you to live in the peace of God, the irene, the at one with God life, then you can stop living as someone trying to become with God and start living as someone being with God. You can stop living for the kingdom of God and start living from the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. That's worth saying again once more, only this time, I want you to hear it to you personally. If you today will believe what the gospel actually proclaims, that Christ and him crucified was enough to reconcile you to God, enough for you to live in the peace of God, the at one with God life, then you can stop living as someone trying to become with God and start living as someone being with God. You can stop living for the kingdom of God and start living from the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Spirit. Now, you might say to me, that's a bold claim, Phelan. I mean, can you even say that for yourself? Are you living in the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Spirit of the kingdom of God? All I can say is this. I believe I have only scratched the surface of the grace of God, the in Christ life, but in doing so, I have tasted enough of the goodness of God already to be absolutely convinced that there are depths to the peace of God and heights to this set at one with God life that still lie before us. The whole of creation has been groaning for the church to mature, to so grow up into the life of Christ that we start to speak words from heaven, words that renew the face of the earth, words that bring light where there is darkness and order where there is chaos. So today again, I proclaim this foolish message, not only to you, but to my own soul, that we would all rise up today to take hold of what he took hold of us for, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For it cannot be the will of God that the body of Christ continues to speak in a language that Christ himself never spoken the language of separation. God bless you. Persecution and Miracles Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. 
end when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derb, cities of Laconia, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet! And he leaped and walked. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Laconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of man. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitudes, crying out and saying, Man, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea and all things that are in them who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways nevertheless he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derb. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now, when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commanded to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples.